The images of the protesters being dispersed by police using force took me back to the 1960s when African Americans were fighting for their civil rights. Congressman John Lewis was a part of that struggle. He almost lost his life on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama at the hands of law enforcement. Somehow Congressman Lewis managed to survive his beating and has become a champion of human rights and civil rights, the pursuit of equality and justice in America. To say that Congressman Lewis is a man of honor, integrity, human decency, the best that America has to offer is well known on both sides of the aisle. But what is not well known is that Congressman Lewis is fighting pancreatic cancer. And yet there he was, on the very street that law enforcement had cleared so that the President of the United States could walk from the Rose Garden to St. John's Episcopal Church without having to come in contact with the protesters. One can only think what Congressman Lewis was thinking on that very street that is now named Black Lives Matter Plaza by the mayor of D.C. Perhaps how far King's dream has come and still how far it has to go for the last vestiges of white supremacy to be dismantled so that the person is not judged by the color of their sin but by the content of their character. Uh, Langston Hughes, a black poet and activist during the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s, wrote a poem about the perils of a dream deferred. He writes, does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore? and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? This explosion we have seen on the streets in the wake of George Floyd's death and the response of law enforcement to disperse the crowd through violent means if necessary has me thinking about how Jesus had compassion on the crowd that was harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. What if we were to have the compassion of Christ? How would our world change? How would we look at the protesters? Would they be seen through the prism of law and order or seen through the lens of compassion? I think the latter. I think compassion demands we put ourselves to the extent that it's possible in the shoes of the other. And if we did, we might ask ourselves, what would cause so many to risk life and limb to protest? Could it be the weight of an oppressive regime that literally and figuratively has its knee on the throat of the oppressed? Remember, in Jesus' day, that oppressive regime was the Roman Empire and the Jewish collaborators who enforced the Pax Romana at the end of a sword. In Dietrich Bonhoeffer's day, the oppressive regime were the Nazis and the collaborators. In our day, the oppressive regime is a system that benefits whites at the expense of people of color. Though slavery has been abolished, those civil rights have been codified into law, equal treatment under the law has a way to go. And as you probably already know, blacks are far more likely to serve harsher sentences than whites for the same crime. 
and that blacks are far more likely to be victims of police brutality than whites, and that blacks are far more likely to be turned down for loans, for a job, for membership in prestigious clubs than their white counterparts. It seems that before we explain away these disparities, compassion demands of us to place ourselves in their shoes. 400 years is a long time to wait for equal justice under the law. And for the white church to say to the black church to be patient that your day will finally come harkens back to what the white ministers in Birmingham, Alabama told King in an op-ed whilst King was in jail for disturbing the peace. King would smuggle out his response on toilet paper that we know as the letter from Birmingham jail. In that letter, King says he's in Birmingham because an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We're called an inescapable network of mutuality tied to a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Yes, King is right. We're called in an inescapable network of mutuality in which what affects one affects all. In other words, there are no innocent bystanders. Compassion demands that we not only put ourselves in the shoes of the protesters, but also the police officers. Imagine what it's like to be tasked with restoring law and order among a throng of angry protesters. Behind the protective gear of the police officers are men and women of all color who fa families to go to at the end of the day. So it's easy to dehumanize the other, to justify our inhumane treatment to them. Violence by its very nature is dehumanizing to victim and to victimizer. What makes the gospel so radical is the compassion Jesus had for the crowd, which included Jews and Romans, oppressed and oppressor, collaborator and non-collaborator, rich and poor alike, a true cross-section of first century Palestine. And yet Jesus has compassion upon them all, for they are harassed and helpless sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they don't have a chance in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth on their own, and neither do we. Thankfully, with the help of Jesus, we can. It seems from Jesus' point of view, the time is ripe for change. He goes so far as to make an agricultural metaphor and declaring the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord of harvest to send workers into his field. Undoubtedly, the disciples must have said, Amen. For the next thing you know, Jesus is sending them out two by two to gather in the harvest by proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So much so, the poor will have good news preached to them, the sick will be healed, the demon possessed will be exorcised, and the dead will be raised. The very activity the disciples have witnessed Jesus doing they are now to do. But how can they? Unless they had the same spirit that rested upon Jesus, now rests upon them. Matthew anticipates the giving the Holy Spirit for instructions Jesus gave his first disciples turns out to be better suited for the church. We're being summoned by the living Christ to go to get involved, to be bystanders no more, and proclaiming the good news of the gospel. Jesus understands that he's sending them out into a hostile world, but still they go. They are to be gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. 
They're even forbidden to take a staff as a weapon to fend off those who would do them harm. Their only defense is the words, the words, the words that Jesus will give them. If a town does not receive them, they are to brush off the dust off their sandals and go to the next town. But if a town does receive them, they are to stay and share the good news. A pattern of giving and receiving will be established for the benefit of all. The town benefits by receiving the good news of Christ's power to set the captives free from the power of sin and death. The disciples benefit and that they're given a roof over their head, food for their bellies, and a warm place to lay their head at night until their ministry is finished. In this scenario, the beloved community has come to town and Jesus is at the center of it all. Unfortunately, this picture that Matthew paints does not resemble the church today, which can seem preoccupied with its own survival rather than being sent to the harassed and helpless. And I suspect that we will not find it unless we find our passion for Christ. Uh, many of us had it at one time, but the cares of this world choke out the world, the word Believe it or not, we can even become jaded to the politics we see outside the church. Are you jaded about the politics of outside the church? Can I get an amen? amen? I know I am. We can become jaded about the politics outside the church that we see, but we also can become jaded to the politics that we see inside the church especially when people fight for power and for privilege, confusing their fiefdom with the kingdom. Believe it or not, in my 30 years of ministry, I've seen many a person lose their passion for Christ and his church while serving on a committee or serving on session. One possible explanation might be that we expect others to live up to what we think church life ought to look like and be like. We forget that imperfect people serve in an imperfect institution called the church. We confuse discipleship with serving on the committee. No wonder many in the church have lost their passion. Doing church work rather than the work of the church robs us of our passion the only solution I know is to be discipled in the way of compassion. John Lewis has the compassion of Christ that the rest of us need at this moment in our nation's history. Listen to what he has to say that gives him hope for the future. My philosophy is very simple. When you see something that is not right, not fair, and not just, you have to say something. You have to do something. You cannot afford to be quiet. Difficult times that we're going through as a nation and as a people. But we must never, ever give up. We must keep the faith and keep pushing and keep pulling, and it's all gonna work out. I believe that, I believe it's going to work out. I know the past few days, the past few weeks, been tough, been hard. But we must keep the faith. We must hang in there, be brave and bold, and it's going to work out. We 
we must see that all of our young people, all of our children, continue to receive the best possible education. And teach our children, teach our young people the way of peace, the way of love. Teach our young people the philosophy and the discipline for nonviolence. And never, ever to hate. We are helping to change not just America, to make America better, but we are helping to change the world and make our world a better place for all humankind. I'm very hopeful about the future. We have all of these smart, gifted young people. They're going to help us get there. And as a nation, As members of the world community, we will get there. We will redeem the soul of America and help create what Dr. King called the beloved community. Sounds like Representative Lewis has lived the truth of our text from Paul. We boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. What might seem like an impossible task has just become possible because hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Representative Lewis knows this. May we know it as well. As the love of God is poured into our lives like empty vessels waiting to be filled, like parched souls ready to be quenched, like disciples eager to be sent in the name of love and in the power of love to a world bereft of God's love. All because Jesus had compassion on those harassed and helpless. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.